sir, when you get a report of an MRI LS spine of a patient who's come to you with low back ache, you have seen some sort of red flags and you've ordered an MRI. So what are your expectations from the report? What are the findings that are actually important for you to plan for the management? Right. So, hi friends, I'm Dr. Apoor Mehra and uh, thank you Dr. Zana for having me in this video. So, as a clinician, you know, uh, when I evaluate my patient, there are certain findings which I always see. And I would like that they correlate with my radiology. So, every every time when there's a report is written, clinical radiological evaluation or assessment is required. So, first thing that I want to see in a patient is the patient has a list or not, right? So, that can tell me about whether I am dealing with uh, what kind of symptoms. Second thing, when I clinically evaluate a patient, I want to look at the straight leg raising test. So, if there is any nerve root gone or not. And during the history, I would always ask that patient has got unilateral or bilateral symptoms or any symptom of decreased sensation or heaviness in the leg. Will that come after some distance of travel that indicates neurogenic claudication? And how does it change? So, when I look at the MRI, the, the commonest thing which a patient, in fact, they read the report. I don't read the report initially. I first look at the MRI. Mm. So my point is the patients today are very, very intelligent. So they know that is a clinician looking at the MRI or only the report. So my habit is to first see the patient. Many a time they come with the MRI or many a time I order the MRI. Then I will look at the MRI mm. and then I will read the report. So what I have seen and an expert radiologist has written, they correlate to each other. Mm. So I would like to know about is there loss of curvature which is universally mentioned in every MRI report hmm. all right uh, the second thing i want to know about is the 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 bones they are aligned or not what what to what level is there i also am very interested to know whether there is sacralization or lumbarization or not hmm. because i want to know which is the last disc in the patient if the patient is going to be operated tomorrow right because that is a decision making in the operation theater which I have to do and radiologist always counts the disc. Classically, I was told that you start counting from the top and you go till the bottom. So, a good radiologist will always screen the entire uh, spine and will find out which is the level that we are dealing with. Then only we can know which is the last disc which is there in the patient. I will like to know what happens to my ligamentum flavum. Is there a secondary stenosis or not? I often deal with uh, congenital patients. Mm. Is there a primary stenosis like in achondroplasia or mm. not? And then I want to look at the disc. In disc, I am very particular about comparing the disc to the previous disc, indicator of hydration. Because we all know that the disc is majority of water mm. and then the fibrocartilage. Yeah. And water is like uh, giving the strength mm. to the disc. Mm. So if it becomes dehydrated, then it's going to bulge out. These are some other things. Also, in, in, in an MRI of LS spine, I'm very much interested into the sacroiliitis. Mm, right. Because at any age, you know, we have seen that there is sacroiliitis, uh, Dr. Zainab, and uh, people do come to me with late onset mm -hmm. spondylitis, ankylizing spondylitis. Mm -hmm. So, this is something which I want to look yes. at. Yes. So, sir, basically, uh, what we discussed in this video, uh, how we approach an MRI spine is, is you know, a short form to remember is ABCD. So, we start with the alignment. In the alignment, we obviously see whether there is lordosis maintained or not. We look for lysthesis in the first thing. That's the first thing we check for the alignment. The second is the bone marrow, whether there's any bone marrow signal intensity change or not, which may, you know, bring to a system, which may bring to light a systemic issue in the patient. Then we look at the spinal cord. So, C for cord, where we are also checking for any compression up front, you know, if there is any cord compression which is resulting cord signal intensity changes or not and see for counting so that is where from the top we'll count there are you know certain other points that we've discussed what if i don't have a scanogram right so with the help of iliolumbar ligament we can localize l5 and we count whether there's any transitional vertebra or not so that's c and then we come to the main thing which is the disc so in the disc as you discussed we will be discussing about the desiccation signal intensity changes then we discuss whether there is any herniation which may be focal or there is any disc bulge which is diffuse in nature and then we talk about the compartmentalization whether it's 
it's a central herniation, it's a foraminal extension or an extra foraminal extension. So depending on that, we're talking about disc and then going on to the spinal canal per se, we talk about the ligamentum flavor and the facet joint. So this is how we usually approach and something that lots of radiologists miss is the last part, which is about the paraspinal tissue. So we want to talk about the muscles, we want to talk about the aorta in, in you know, lots of cases we are reporting the spine and you'll pick up an incidental aneurysm or an aortic dissection. You may pick up retroperitoneal lymph nodes, you may pick up sacroiliitis as Sir said. So this is something which is very important, which are the incidental findings that the MRI has not been done for, but you will pick up, you know, in, in one case, I remember we picked up CA rectum in a patient who had come for LS spine screening, you know, so, so this is something uh, that is how this is the checklist that we follow while, while reporting. So now when we talk about the numbers, so what are the measurements that, that you're looking for in the report? Right. So like uh, the, the basic thing I want to look at is the, what is the canal diameter? Yes. And for a surgeon, if it is less than 10 millimeters, right, hmm. you are looking for an indication for surgery. Now, here comes a decision, right, where you have to talk clinically to a patient. Hmm. First episode, irrespective of the canal diameter, 90% they get okay. Hmm. So, you have to treat them with uh, non-operative management. Second episode, again, 90% get okay, but 90% might have recurrence. Hmm. Third episode, then the numbers become very important. Right. Because if the numbers are less than 10 millimeter, you indicate for surgery. So any disease of spine, you know, there are only three indications of surgery. Number one is bowel bladder involvement, irrespective of the episode. Hmm. Number two, progressive weakness. Hmm. Number three, no improvement. So third episode means it's not improving. That's what we want. And we would like them, uh, the radiologist to give us the, the, the numbers for all the important levels. Right. Majority of the patients we see our L4, L5 or L5 S1 disc. Hmm. So that area, we would be very happy if we are, we are, we are being told what's the number. If in fact, in young population, when we have uh, claudication symptoms, hmm. Hmm. this number becomes more significant because I just told that if you have a congenital anomaly or something else coming up in a young adolescent patient, hmm. then you might have to take up surgery early so that the permanent neural deficit does not occur. Right. Right. Um, now, if we can talk a bit about clinical localization uh, as far as the nerve roots are concerned, because as a radiologist, we are frequently unaware of, you know, how to localize. Yes, we can see the compression of the nerve root on the spine, but if you want to correlate it clinically, I think this is something which is a very useful uh, skill that we tend to ignore, you know. We don't really look at the patient and correlate the findings. If I'm seeing foraminal compression, let's say at L5S1, you should go back and see whether there's exiting root compression or not, you know, and how can I find that out in the the patient who's there in front of me. So Fantastic. So, yeah. so let's let's go to the next image, uh, Dr. Dhanam. Yes, right. So if I draw right, what I have been uh, taught is that if you have a vertebra, I am talking about lumbar, the cervical is different. Yeah. So every vertebra has two eyes and one nose. Eye is the pedicle, nose is the spinous process. Every vertebra is like this. All right. So uh, for example, if you have a destruction of a pedicle, single destruction is called as winking owl sign and both the destruction are called as blind bat. This is what radiological uh, appearance is for the x-rays or simple, you can pick it up early. Yeah. But when I have, supposedly this is my L4 vertebra. This is my L5 vertebra. This is L4, L5 disc. Right. So this is L4, L5 disc, right? So the rule says that the L4 nerve root, so let, let me draw the nerve root with red. L4 nerve root will exit beneath the pedicle and this is how it goes. The L5, this is L4 nerve root. The L5 nerve root will go like this. Okay. So as we know that if if I draw with a blue color, that there's a disc prolapse, right? Majority of the disc prolapse are postolateral, mm. all right? And or rarely the foraminal or far lateral as they call it, mm. all right? So if the disc prolapse occurs, it usually occurs here. Yeah. That's the area it occurs. These are the areas that occurs, okay? So when it occurs in this area, it is going to compress the L5 nerve root because that's the nerve root which is traveling. Mm. Yes. This is a traveling nerve root. Yeah. But if, as you just said, it is a foraminal or far lateral disc prolapse, mm. 
then it can compress the same level Correct. so a radiologist who's 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 actually drawing right this image who's, who's shown the arrow here is telling you that this nerve root is getting compressed here hmm. all right and with this you know they can they can just give, give a hint so i'll correlate it clinically as dr danav asked me if my patient comes to me with weakness of dorsiflexion of ankle hmm. that is tibialis anterior which is supplied by l4 nerve root hmm. and if radiologist reports there is an l4 l5 displax which is far lateral or foraminal it hmm. means it is correlating clinically yeah. and if the patient has a foot drop hmm. right it means the l4 has gone down it means this requires indication for a surgery okay. next if my patient has got weakness of ehl so l4 is tibialis anterior hmm. in l5 that is extensor hallucis longus hmm. so it is extension of the great toe foot i cannot show my foot on the table so i am just trying to do this this is great toe let's assume gusani can like this is great toe okay so extensor hallucis longus is gone and my radiologist says posterior lateral disc at l4 l5 it correlates l5 gone yeah. similarly at l5 s1 mm. right somebody comes and tells me there is a posterior lateral disc s1 nerve root is gone mm. right then there is loss of ankle reflex right. or flex hallucis longus so that's how you correlate similarly the sensation mm. it's not just the motor sensation mm. l4 will have loss on the medial aspect of the foot mm. l5 great toe s1 little toe so simple right. so if you are able to correlate clinically and the radiologist says that this is how you decide whether to operate or not to operate hmm. if the correlation is not there hmm. we we'll look for secondary causes similarly i want to take an opportunity here dr zainab you said uh, alignment yeah so vital alignment is definitely important yeah. and so is the coronal right to tell me about the scoliosis okay that is important i do look at it because you also gave us coronal views right as you just said you picked up a ca rectum mm. we picked up kidney lesion mm. on a coronal view mm. to one of my relatives and she finally had an rcc which was operated okay. so it is very important to not just look at the tree it is important to look at the entire forest so look at the entire thing because that's the role of a radiologist radiologists have more scans than they print mm. so they can always pick up more things which are around Yeah. and sometimes you know it is very beneficial because a patient comes to you if i am a radiologist who does an mri i will just look at the disc mm. but because you people don't see clinically so you are supposed to report everything mm. so that's a blessing in disguise for us because you will look at all the things and will report and many a time that happens there is something else that comes to us frequently in mri of lumbosacral spine or pelvis the ovarian lesions hmm. yes. they are reported yeah. and many many lives have been saved because of that so it is very very useful coming to the bone beautiful thing you mentioned at the at the marrow consistency mm. it should always be very carefully spoken about mm. because that is something you pick up multiple myeloma yeah that's where you pick up vitamin d deficiencies and simple blood test of serum electrophoresis or calcium phosphate alp or osteoporosis bone density can be picked up mm. there are ignored vertebral osteoporotic collapses yeah. they are so important which are picked up and yes what you what you said about the disc majority of the lesions about uh, the lumbar spine young patients is about the disc hmm. right does that answer what you had yes, asked sir. yes sir so if i can just correlate this mri for you so here we can see that there is a bulge here at l5 s1 level when we go to the axial scans we can make out that there's an extrusion there's a focal extrusion yeah. here which is compressing on the traversing root yeah. so as you explained so beautifully this will be the s1 root because we are at l5 s1 it's yes. the s1 traversing root so clinically as you said we will be now looking at the ankle reflex yeah yes. so ideally a radiologist should also examine the patient and just see if it is correlating with the finding that we are reporting it will further enhance our own understanding of the patient as a whole and not just the mri so we will look at the ankle reflex and if we want to examine the sensory aspect i will look at the little finger here in this particular patient yes. and there may be a sensory loss if 100% yeah. yes in fact uh, to the young budding radiologist i want to tell you here you know the knowledge all of you will have all of you will study but the differentiating factor in today's world as a clinician is that i usually get a call from the radiologist and they talk to me that these are the findings that we have 
does that correlate clinically to you hmm. or do you want something else one before finalizing the report it's not a bad idea to speak to your clinician yeah and more so in the initial years because you will know because the clinician will clearly tell you diameter if there's a blood involvement or s1 l4 l5 what are they suspecting in fact there is there is one clinician i know he always write down look for l5 s1 dysprolapse and tell us the diameter hmm. so that is what you know a clinician should actually address to that level if not yes. then the radiologist should show to the clinician and that is the best way before preparing the report if that can be done yeah right can you show me where is uh, ligamentum flavum in this image yes sir so this is the ligamentum flavum so we look at it at this level where you are seeing the thecal sac so this is the facet joint this is the same level that we look at for the ligamentum flavum so in this case we can see that there is no arthropathy here the joint is maintained and ligamentum flavum is also normal right so this is this is uh, the transfer section yes sir right so i'll tell you i have seen most of the people talking about ligam ligamentum flavum here Hmm. in this area all right because this is this is this ligamentum flavum again yeah, yeah. right but the good idea is to always look at the way she's told here is that correct anna yes right so what dr zanab tells you is it's better to comment on ligamentum flavum in a transverse section because that is very very important because if you look carefully it looks very thickened out in the hmm. sagittal sections hmm. all right anything else uh, which which is of significance to to an orthopedic surgeon here is the hydration of the disc dr zanab hmm. so what i although this image is a little different but hmm. what i always tell them is if it is gray hmm. right if it is gray this area it is hydrated disc and whatever is extruding will always be dark black hmm. that means hydration is water content so grayish color means there's some water content into it hmm. and when it goes away all right then it means uh, that it is going to be a dehydrated extruded disc or a whatever disc it is so when i tell them i start from the top and tell them this is this is gray 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 black and it's come out which which uh, images are these t1 t2 so these are t2 so we talk only about t2 because i never we never look at uh, t1 images when we are talking about pathology as clinician so we are more interested but if i would like if i would like to have an image i would like to have a box there certain radiology centers they will they will cut out a box in one of the big images and they'll show you this is the main pathology right that makes it very very easy so yes. people who are preparing the reports yeah right they, if they can show us the main area which is which is being compressed that is going to make a huge difference and more so in the knee and then the spine spine mm -hmm. mri is a relatively easier for the clinicians to explain to the patient hmm. but knees are little difficult more so for the meniscus right so so the insight we got from here is that you know give them the finding we can just magnify like in this case there are four images which in a nutshell uh, summarizes the entire pathology of the patient you know so if we can give this to the clinician i think it will be really helpful and another thing which you spoke about were the coronal images so when we do a routine spine scan you know we usually don't take coronals when we are doing for degeneration so that's again a very useful tip that we should at least do once one plane whether it's a stir or a t2 weighted image we should do one coronal image for scanning because we can't really comment on the lateral curvature on a sagittal image right so this is something which we usually in routine scans don't do so that's something which is uh, really insightful that that is also one screening that we should do we do a screening of the whole spine in most degenerative spines when when asked for but coronal is also something that we should include in our routine practice so i think that's a, that's a phenomenal way of understanding uh, after this lecture i'm very sure that that all the students listening to it will have a proper clarity about how to talk about degenerative spine and their scans and more so how to correlate clinically and also how to correlate with the clinician yes right that's what so thank you so much sir usually you know our job ends here when we submit this report so thank you for taking us to the other side and and uh, you know giving us the insight as to how we can make this better how we can be more involved as uh, clinical radiologists thank you so much thank you very much for having me in this video